Hello there, broadcasting live today from London. This is episode 49 of JW Watch, the show that keeps a close eye on all things JW, offering Jehovah's Witnesses a more objective viewpoint on current developments that the governing body almost certainly doesn't want them to hear. Towards the end of last month, Pennsylvania Attorney General Josh Shapiro announced criminal charges against four individuals related to child sexual abuse, all of these individuals residing in Pennsylvania, and all of these charges were involving child sexual abuse within Jehovah's Witnesses. The four men are said to have accumulated between them 19 victims, some of whom were their own children. Joining me to discuss this shocking case is today's co-host, friend of the channel and fellow YouTube vlogger, Jana Montero. Hello. And we are also joined uh, by Diana who is a court reporter for from Pennsylvania with some knowledge of at least one of the defendants. Welcome, Diana. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for having me, Lloyd. My absolute pleasure. So viewers will be uh, familiar with you, Jana. Um, I've obviously had the pleasure of interviewing you uh, on the channel, and you've also helped co-host in the past. So thank you for taking time out of your schedule to discuss this important case. Thank you for welcoming me back. And uh, Diana, perhaps you could just share a little bit about um, how you, uh, your connection with this in terms of your expertise. Um, Well, I have been a court reporter or a court stenographer for 30 years. Um, Started my career actually over in London. And then when I moved back to Pennsylvania in 2000, I started working for um, the county that I I just recently retired from just a week and a half ago. And um, I was in what they call an official court reporter. And I reported on a variety of cases, anything from family to civil to um, criminal. Unfortunately, a lot of those were sexual abuse cases Um, and a lot more than, you know, I probably dozens, more than dozens. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're well positioned, not just in terms of your expertise as a court reporter, but specifically your expertise within Pennsylvania to help us understand what's happening here and, you know, what the processes are and, you know, maybe the timescales. I think to help the viewers, um, we were talking about this off air, perhaps it would be, sorry, go on, Jana. Uh, Did you work specifically with this attorney general? Um, I haven't worked with these people in the past. Yes. Um, Not on this case. I haven't worked on this case. Yes. And I'm quite familiar with some of them. Yeah. Some of them actually, actually one of them used to work at, he was a district attorney in the the county I just retired from. (laughs) Josh Shapiro seems to be very competent and um, he... I've, you know, he's obviously uh, very proactive, particularly on the issue of child sexual abuse, as far as I can tell. Yes, I'm very impressed with Mr. Shapiro. Excellent. Uh, I thought it would be helpful to look at uh, the news conference where this particular case was discussed. And as we were saying off air, um, it's because it's a 13 minute video, but I do think it's worthwhile sharing it for viewers who perhaps haven't seen the press conference, um, and I'm interested to get input. So if at any point either of you have any contribution to make during the press briefing, uh, just raise your hand and I'm going to pause the uh, video. So go on, Jana. I think it's important to point out that this is 
the person who's about to speak. This is an official press briefing. This is not what uh, the organization would dub apostate lies because it's not coming from either of us. Indeed, and that's kind of the main reason why I wanted to show it because, uh, you know, this isn't speculation. This is, uh, unfor- as much as I would want this to not be true, because we're talking about 19 victims, uh, unfortunately it is. Uh, but uh, at least it's heartening to know that something's being done about it. So, Absolutely. Uh, let's just see what Mr. Shapiro has to say. Good morning, everyone. We are here today to announce the 49th investigating grand jury has voted on and approved presentments for charges related to four individuals for committing sexual abuse throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Before I go forward, I'd like to introduce the public servants who stand with me here today. Executive Deputy Attorney General Jennifer Selber, Chief Deputy Attorney General Kirsten Hine, Chief Deputy Attorney General Ron Eisenberg is not with us, but did important work on this case. Assistant Chief Deputy Attorney General Dan Dye, our lead prosecutor on this case, and Supervisory Special Agent Doug Hilliard. I also want to make mention and give thanks to the members of the grand jury. We appreciate their service. These are independent citizen grand jurors who participated in this process reviewed and came to their own determination about evidence and returned these charges that I'm here to announce today. As many of you know, our office takes the abuse of children very seriously. We have arrested over 500 offenders for taking advantage of and exploiting children all throughout this Commonwealth. And that work continues here today. The cases that we are here to announce are deeply disturbing. The allegations, hard to imagine, while all sharing one common tie. The 19 victims and four men who are being charged with sexually violating them are all members of the Jehovah's Witness organization. Most of these defendants use their faith and church to gain access to their victims, to build their trust, and then molested them. I'm just going to pause it there. Uh, sorry, uh, I'll, I'll take your your comments in just a moment, John, and maybe it will tie into what I'm about to say. That you know, you know, this is an organisation that strenuously denies any issues um, with child sexual abuse, and yet what Mr. Shapiro is saying here, who let's remember is not an apostate, who is a neutral third party, in fact, uh, a person of some authority. Um, he's saying that we have people who have used their positions of trust within the organization uh, to commit their crimes. Um, So this would seem to conflict with the messages that have been coming out of Jehovah's Witnesses on this subject. Absolutely. And the, um, The Watchtower article that's actually coming up this weekend that Jehovah's Witnesses are going to be studying is titled, You Can Trust Your Brothers. Right. And there's an entire part about being the first to forgive, to look past uh, the transgressions of your brothers in order to pursue peace in the congregation. And... um, when we hear stuff like this, it is stomach turning because I, I alone know, besides myself, uh, several other women who have had to deal with this situation with brothers who have used their status in the congregation. Mm. Absolutely. Yes. As a born in, um, Yes, (laughs) I've had my fair share as well. So, yeah, again, um, it's one thing to kind of say that you take child sexual abuse seriously, that you view it as, quote unquote, abhorrent. But what's the track record? And in this case, the track record is, is not looking good. So let's let Mr. Shapiro continue. Children who have a right to grow up 
in a safe community, but were defiled by members of their own congregations. Some defendants only looked as far as their own families to commit their abuse. My office will not stop until these defendants are held accountable for the crimes against innocent children and until justice is achieved for these courageous survivors. This investigation began with a resource referral from a local district attorney's office back in 2019. Based on that referral, our office undertook the investigation of allegations of sexual assault involving members of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Throughout that, we learned of several incidents of sexual assault committed by different members of the Jehovah's Witness religious organizations. And as a result of our three-year investigation, hundreds of hours of grand jury testimony and dozens of witnesses, we filed charges against four individuals. I can report that early this morning, three of those men were taken into custody. One was arrested in Pennsylvania, one in the state of Georgia, and one in New York State. I want to thank the honorable men and women. Sorry, go on, Johnny, you raised your hand. So I have a question for you, Diana, um, because I know that I, I know that you're not law enforcement, but so these men were arrested all related to this same case um, in and the case is being tried in Pennsylvania. So that's assuming that the law that the laws were all broken in Pennsylvania, that the abuses all happened in Pennsylvania. So it doesn't matter that these men have since uh, moved to these and their arrest occurred in a different state. Oh, no, absolutely not. The, the crimes were actually committed in Pennsylvania, so the, they are charged in Pennsylvania. And <clears throat> they will be brought back, <clears throat> um, extradited, or come back on their own recognizance, I don't know, back to Pennsylvania to face the charges, correct? And I picked up on, uh, you know, you have to understand that um, I'm, I'm a Brit, uh, a Brit and a Croatian. <laughs> and uh, we don't necessarily do attorney generals. In Britain, we have the Crown Prosecution mm -hmm. uh, Service. Um, but, you know, just for complete simpletons uh, or people like myself who don't fully understand uh, US criminal prosecution procedures, uh, it's safe to say that, you know, this is not something that's ongoing in terms of establishing what's happened. This is a three year process that has culminated in criminal charges. So um, w w what's next? Is it just sentencing? Well, I guess I should maybe flesh that out a little bit um, for you, Lloyd. Mm -hmm. um, so a grand jury is, is not a constant thing. Mm -hmm. um, every few years, Pennsylvania will um, create a grand jury. And so the process starts. And if you think of Pennsylvania for you, the Brits, <laughs> people that live in the states. Pennsylvania is a state in our country, but within Pennsylvania, we have the little counties as well. And, and they all have their own jurisdictions. Um, so what happened in this case is a grand jury was picked and they're basically picked from all over the state of Pennsylvania. Um, they're common, actually, I was part of the selection process last year for this grand jury. I didn't hear any of the cases, but um, I was the reporter for the selection of them. And what happens is they are, they're given a number, you don't know their names, and they're told <clears throat> you will be serving, if you're picked, you'll be serving, it's in 18 months, sometimes two years. Um, and you will be handed a bunch of cases you meet twice a month. It's a big commitment. I mean, a lot of people were like, you know, horrified that they, two years out of their life. But so what happens is they're, they're, they're picked. Um, and they're handed a bunch of cases. So it's not just one case. This, this case we're talking about is probably dozens. And sometimes they can have ongoing cases all at once, you know, like rotating. So what would happen is they would, the grand jury is actually allowed to question witnesses, unlike a regular jury. So a grand jury can actually bring the witnesses they can subpoena witnesses as well they have a lot of power it's almost like having um a, the power of an attorney you know a prosecutor they can subpoena phone records um anything they want 
And then um, once they, you know, look at everything, then they'll come to a conclusion. Yes, there's enough here, you know, to, to we think to bring the charges. And that's exactly what happened. Um, they said, yes, they returned it back to the, the, um, the state attorney. And the reason that the state attorney has attorney general is because it covers the whole state of Pennsylvania. These men lived in different counties. One lives in the county I'm in. Um, the other one lived in a northern county. So they're all over. So when it's the whole, you know, uh, conglomerate of state of counties put together, that's when the grand um, the, the attorney general steps in and takes jurisdiction over over all of them. So it's going to be in the attorney general's hands when it goes uh, to trial. So, so that there will be, the, despite the charges being brought by by a jury, there will be a trial. Um, and will the trial be before a, a judge or before a judge and jury? It could be either. Mm. Um, or it could be a guilty plea. You right. know, at this point, uh, <clears throat> what they need to do is they're going to have to um, produce the charges. So, you know, there's different, there's different, you know, um, sets. You can have felonies, misdemeanors, felony ones, twos, or threes. So what they're going to do is put uh, like a complaint together, an affidavit, um, of charges. And once that's done, um, they will bring <clears throat> the defendant in for what they call an arraignment. So he comes before the court and all he's, all the, they say is they're either guilty or not guilty. If they plead guilty, then they'll say, okay, we'll send you, send, you know, set a sentencing date for, you know, six months from now. If they say not guilty, then, then it will proceed to a trial with a, a jury or, in the state of Pennsylvania, um, if both sides agree, which is the prosecution and the defense side, if they both agree, they can have what they call a bench trial, where the judge is actually <clears throat> the one who makes the decision. Right. Because right. In, a, in a jury trial, you know, they, they, they just find the facts. Jurors are just the finders of the facts, you know, the, and the judge is basically, you know, does the law. But when you say I want a, a bench trial, you, what you're doing is you're leaving it up to the judge to be both of those. Interesting. And so we have uh, a trial forthcoming, um, but just again, just to state things very simply for, for viewers to understand, whereas in the past when we've covered cases on JW Watch and previously Watch Time in Focus, in many cases we've been talking about civil cases where you have a plaintiff on one side and you have, uh, or plaintiffs, and you have a defendant or defendants on the other side. In this case, it's a criminal prosecution and it's the state of Pennsylvania against these four individuals. Is that correct? Correct. It actually, we're, we're Commonwealth. <laughs> so it's the Commonwealth right. of Pennsylvania. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I apologize. Right. It's a full name, yeah. Yeah, I know. So, <laughs> They'll bring that's it. a bit confusing from a British <laughs> angle, but there we go. I thought you guys got your independence, but there we go. Yeah. So um, yeah, so they they will um, bring the charges. The um, it'll probably be tra it'll probably be um, tried in Harrisburg, which is not that far from me. And um, the 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 uh, attorney um, general will be the mm -hmm. one leading it. He'll be the what they call the prosecution. Okay. And as we'll see, uh, it sounds like they amassed a large amount of uh, evidence and witness statements and i just i hope for the survivors that these men just this the men that are left uh, just plead guilty um but unfortunately we've seen um as with the case earlier this year in california um that the elder who was accused of 10 different victims has been arrested like three different times and each time pleads not guilty mm -hmm. Yeah, it depends. I mean, people can say things under the heat of the moment, but, you know, they can always change their mind. You know, they might say, yeah, I did it, but then change their mind later and decide to go to go to a trial. It's, it's entirely up, up to them whether they choose that or not. And at this point, I'm not sure who's going to trial and who's going to, you know, who, who's going to plead. I mean, once they lawyer up, you know, they, they might have a different view <laughs> on that. And when you talk about lawyering up, um, at this point, I'm guessing it's uncertain as to whether uh, they'll be left to their own devices or whether they'll be represented by Watchtower lawyers, by the um, legal department. Oh, I doubt that. 
Oh, really? I've never seen that. No. Right. And I've repeat, reported a few cases over the years where there have been JW um, allegations. No, 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 no. These men, I mean, unless they have money to afford a, a private attorney, will be appointed, <clears throat> will be appointed attorneys because when you're in prison, you get appointed at a public defender. But it, it is in the, in, I, I, again, I, you know, I'm glad to hear that. Um, it is in the interests, however, of the legal department to um, make sure that these men don't get, uh, don't go to jail. Um, so they would surely have a vested interest in trying to stop this from going to its, uh, you know, its um, seemingly anticipated conclusion. Maybe. I, I don't know. I mean, my first thought is they're probably going to wash their hands of it mm. and distance themselves, mm -hmm. um, which usually happens not only with this religion, but, in, you know, some other religions I've covered. Yeah. They kind mm -hmm. of step back and, well, they're not a member of the, the church or whatever anymore. We, we you know, so it, it might be that I, it would be very it's going to be very interesting to see what actually happens. We won't know. I mean, it's sure. too early right now. OK. So let's uh, continue with the press briefing. Let's just see here. Women of the New Windsor Police, Butler. I'm just going to rewind. Re Thank the bit. honorable men and women of the New Windsor Police, Butler Township Police, and the Coffee County Sheriff's Office in Georgia for their assistance in today's apprehensions. I will now go through each case individually but encourage you to read the presentments, which will provide a greater level of detail of the crimes and the criminal counts that we are here charging today. First, Jose Serrano, 69, of Lancaster County. During the investigation, it was determined that Jose Serrano used his influence and common faith to sexually molest at least six minors, including his own daughter. He confessed to committing many of these criminal offenses to members of his community and to the grand jury. Two of Serrano's victims testified in front of our grand jury, providing detail about the abuse that they suffered at his hands, which included groping that escalated into forcible rape. Serrano's own daughter testified to the grand jury that her mother would remind her to lock the door at night if her father was around. Serrano was charged with aggravated indecent assault, indecent assault, and endangering the welfare of children. Jesse Hill, 52 years old, formerly of Berks County, Pennsylvania, and now a resident of the state of Georgia. The grand jury heard testimony that Hill used his milling business to lure young boys in his Jehovah's Witness congregation with promises of alcohol, marijuana, and pornography, he lured them to his property for parties in the 1990s. He built a rapport with these victims, taking them to movie theaters and area malls and providing them with gifts. As time went on, Hill would expose himself to the children. He would grope them. He would force them to perform oral sex. Our investigation identified at least 10 victims of Mr. Hill's sexual crimes. Hill made statements admitting to many of these crimes. Jesse Hill is charged with rape, involuntary deviant sexual intercourse, and corruption of minors. Robert Ostrander, 56 years old, formerly of Cambria County, now a resident of New York State. Ostrander's abuse began in 2006 and was at first physical. This abuse was directed at his family. The grand jurors heard testimony from his stepdaughter who said that by 15 the abuse became sexual, groping and then wrestling and then eventually sexual assault. Ostrander and his family, including his stepdaughter, were active members of Jehovah's Witness congregation. As a result of that membership and the relationship that he and his family enjoyed, his stepdaughter became friends with another girl Ostrander was given unsupervised access to. He exploited that access and sexually assaulted her as well. Ostrander is charged with indecent assault, 
endangering the welfare of children, and corruption of minors. All of the charges against these three defendants have been filed in the corresponding counties of Lancaster, Berks, and Cambria, and will be prosecuted by my office, led by Dan Dye. And finally, Eric Elam, 61 years old, of Butler County. The grand jurors heard testimony from Elam's daughter about the sexual abuse she suffered, including being forced to perform oral sex. She told the grand jury about her father's practice of using sexual molestation as discipline in the house where she was growing up. <clears throat> she he's, he's clearly struggling through this and understandably so. Uh, I mean... It's so upsetting. Yeah. I was just going to raise my hand and say, yeah, it's, it's hard for him to get through it. Mm. It's hard to listen to and it must be very, very hard for him to actually say it because... Um, he, and, and I can understand why he's saying it. Um, you know, these things need to be made a matter of public record. And he, what I found really interesting uh, about the first case was he was saying that um, the individual uh, confessed to elders, you know, which, which we hear a lot about. You know, we hear many examples of where individuals confess during a judicial committee. And because of this whole database issue, um, it gets swept under the rug and it doesn't come to the attention of authorities. In this case, it did come to the attention of authorities and this individual confessed in front of the grand jury. So that, you know, when, when we're talking about what you were saying before, Diana, about, you know, whether people plead guilty or not, how would one admit, admit to doing it to the grand jury and then plead not guilty when it comes to trial? Oh, well, let me make something clear about sure. that. These um, these men, <clears throat> grand jury secret. They 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 have no idea mm. that there was even a grand jury, um, pr you know, proceeding going on. There's no warning. They have yeah. They don't they don't get called in. No, all the grand <laughs> no 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 no. It's all that's why when I report a grand jury, I always had to sign a confidentiality agreement. You know, um, for that because the victims and you know, nobody really, the victims are aware, obviously, because they have to testify, but the defense, the defendant is never made aware that, that this is happening. So okay. I didn't know that or not. <laughs> uh, uh, but I'm just thinking in terms of what you were saying before about how, you know, they could plead either guilty or, or not guilty. Right. Are they and able I'm, to backpedal from that? Are they able to backpedal from what, from, in the case of the first individual, the, the first individual confessed to the grand jury that he'd done these things. Well, he confessed, he... I think he confessed to the, not the grand jury. The elders. Yeah, or the, or, yeah, or the police when they questioned him. Um, but um, yeah, they can always backpedal. I mean, you right. know, a lot of people say things when they're arrested that, you know, um, you know, they can always contest and, um, just and the fact that he admitted it doesn't really mean anything. He can still go to trial on it, and whether that admission is um, going to be allowed to be brought in at the time of trial is will be a matter for the judge. So mm -hmm. what they will do is they'll have something called like a suppression hearing, and they'll say, you know, the common will say, well, we want these in, and then the defense will say, no, we don't think they should come in, and then they cite a bunch of case law, and then the judge makes a, a determination whether <clears throat> whether that comes in or not. So say this confession was made to the elders in like a judicial hearing or a shepherding call. Um, would they be able to use that cover of um, confession? See, I don't know. It, it does. Does that fall under like the clergy? That's I, what I mean. Yeah. You know, but then again, if if it's a crime, um, I you know I think that they're mandated reporters. You know, if, if it's a crime um, and it should have been reported, it should have been. Obviously, this, this has been a problem, though, hasn't it? Throughout the United States, uh, you know, even in country in, in, in states, sorry, like Montana, mm -hmm. where uh, there is mandatory reporting, they were still able to leverage the clergy penitent provisions in order to mm -hmm. 
get the case overturned on appeal. Right. And I've seen that before because we have that here in Pennsylvania, um, you know, like counselors and, you know, they're all mandated reporters when it comes to abuse of, of children. Mm. And, you know, so using that excuse that it's clergy or it was counseling is not going to really fly because a crime has been allegedly committed. Right. Thank you for explaining that. It's, it's so, so helpful to have someone who, you know, <laughs> understands the legal system. The, <laughs> exactly. Being on the coal face uh, in these situations. So I, I really do appreciate you explaining all this. If we can try and stomach a little bit more, let's let's see. She reported this abuse to her mother and to other members. I'm just going to back up a little bit in the house where she was growing up. <clears throat> She reported this abuse to her mother and to other members of her community. Through the documents obtained during our investigation, we obtained a summary of a meeting where Elam told others that the accounts of sexual assault must be true if she said them because, quote, his daughter does not lie. Elam was charged by my office with rape involuntary deviate sexual intercourse, aggravated indecent assault, and endangering the welfare of a child. Early this morning, when agents from our office and local police in Butler County attempted to take him into custody, he retreated into his bathroom and killed himself behind closed doors. No law enforcement officers were harmed in the process. This is tough work. That that's quite an astonishing turn of events to be disclosing it in a in a press briefing. So you know what would the situation be be there with with a with a suicide, uh, Diana? In terms of of, of what? Um, in terms of the you know finding, uh, you know determining guilt or or, or non. So so basically. <sighs> Yeah. You'll never have a trial, and yeah, the, yeah, those charges will never be brought. And unfortunately, mm. you know, his victim um, will never. He's a coward. Yeah, it's the coward way. He, she'll never get closure, or he'll never get closure um, mm. on that. And it's unfortunate, you know. Um, you can't ever undo what was was done to you. Mm. But you know, I've sat and through these cases enough to know that some of these victims, you know, and they come to the sentencing. They do. They actually come and they actually talk sometimes. Mm. Um, and it's the satisfaction of knowing that something was finally done, that they were finally heard, you know, mm. or, or believed, and that this person is actually being punished for the crimes that they have done. Presumably, so, just having this mentioned in the press briefing as as harrowing. As it as it is, and again, he's clearly struggling, um, Josh Shapiro, with, with with relaying this information. Presumably, just having their story told, you know, on this on this stage on this platform will will provide at least some closure. We would hope. I would hope so, and I feel that my heart goes out <clears throat> to that yeah. victim, as, you know, in, in particular for for that reason, you know, and and the, just the horrible way it, it ended for mm. for everyone, the whole family, you know. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, it's not something that you really find closure in. I don't think it's something that you live with forever, right. and you just you heal and live around it. Mm. Um, yeah, but knowing that, that your perpetrator is behind bars, and you know, um, serving serving their time, I think it. It makes me feel maybe a little bit better, but no, you're right. I mean, I'm a survivor too. So, you know, I live with it every day in my life. And unfortunately my abuser never saw a day in prison. So yeah, same. So I think, I think yes, that having this spoken out um, as it is and having them even just press charges against probably brings some sort of um, comfort and knowing that, um, this person hopefully won't hurt another person. Um, and hopefully they're bringing some sort of awareness to the prevalence of the issue. Right. Um, but right. just, uh, yeah. I mean, this, this, that, you know, she'll, yeah. it'll, never, it, it'll, it'll haunt her for the rest of her life, unfortunately. And, and, you know, hopefully she can get counseling and, and try to live a, 
you know, try to live a happy life, but you know, it does definitely affect you. And I'm in my fifties and I've carried it through. So would, would, it be fair, would it be fair to say, you know, speaking to you both now as, as survivors, um, would it be fair to say that perhaps comfort is a better word to use than closure? Just so yes. agree. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Comfort. Mm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Maybe I said the wrong word there. Yeah. It's comfort. Well, yeah. I, I said closure. So I'm, I'm trying yeah. to learn um, <laughs> closure a little bit about, of, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. you can never put it away. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, you know, um, it's not like a divorce, you know, and eventually mm. a closure, you know, it's, it's something that is with you. It's part of you. It's part of, it's, it's part of your everyday life. It, it, and what's also infuriating is if he was still a witness in good standing in the congregation, we don't know if the congregation took these allegations seriously or if they are supporting him or her or, or them, um, and so with this, some will see it as an admission of guilt. And for him, right before he did it, he probably thought my death pays for my sins and I could possibly be resurrected in paradise. Oh, oh who knows? Mm, like that's infuriating that he thought he was getting away with something probably. Mm, yeah, it's like, yeah, he coward's way out, like you said. Absolutely. In the process. This is tough work. And I commend the incredible prosecutors and agents here in my office who do this work day in and day out. And again, thank the members of the grand jury for their important and meaningful work. These are the types of cases that haunt us. They leave an indelible mark on our souls. And as prosecutors, as people of faith, as parents, we can't escape the impact that these cases have. These 19 children, they deserved a place to grow up in peace, not to be preyed upon. This is an abuse of trust, an abuse of power. And I'll remind you that no matter what power you cloak yourself in, everyone is accountable under the law. And if you abuse a child, I want you to know that the Office of the Attorney General here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania will find you and we will hold you accountable. I, I just find his, um, his uh, rhetoric here incredibly um, blunt. And uh, Jay has commented, uh, it seems Shapiro is warning the public about Jehovah's Witnesses in the press conference. But, you know, is, am I the only one who's seeing a man here who uh, is is done, frankly, with um, the amount of abuse within this organization? Yeah, I um, I think where he's saying, no matter what sort of power you think you're cloaking yourself with, you know, people hide behind these titles and these spiritual privileges and these roles in their community that they play and maybe they're charismatic and they give great talks and and secretly they're doing or or maybe not even secretly they're committing atrocities like this 19 19 individuals that they have record of yeah if, that they know of <laughs> that have come forward yeah you have to automatically assume that there's probably more victims out there. There usually is. Yeah. And I, I just, I wish that that conviction that he has was with others who could, who could like subpoena those records that they have just stashed away in the kingdom halls. Because I know there are records from when I talked to the elders. Yeah. I and I, mean, I know that the person that I told them about was repentant and only had just some privileges taken away for a little while. And that was the extent of it. Yeah, and then it's up to you yeah. to forgive. Yeah. I, I don't know what their record retention policy is or, you know, how, how that works on that end. I just know that it's uh, sadly not, you know, working. <laughs> it's not appropriate and it's not, you know, they're not complying. Yeah, I wish that, like he he was saying, that he could peek behind that cloak that 
the, I mean, it's not just those four guys in Pennsylvania, you know, and um, isn't the Watchtower Bible Track Society of Pennsylvania, isn't it? Yeah, that's the, that's kind of a little bit of an irony here is, is yeah. that, um, well, it, it started in Pennsylvania and, and of course they moved their headquarters uh, in 1906 to Brooklyn um, and now they, they continue to, to be in New York. But uh, yeah, I, I think Pennsylvania will be kind of uh, lighting up some, some mental bulbs in the minds of, of Jehovah's Witnesses when they hear that, uh, that location. Um, but what, first of all, I, w- I wanted to say that, um, you know, it, it's very obvious again that uh, Mr. Shapiro is, um, is, is very angry about this. Uh, and he, he seems to be speaking from, from a place of someone who has seen a lot of these stories and is now, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't use the word venting. Um, he, he's using this opportunity to, to say what he thinks um, within the constraints of, of his office, one could say. Um, he's, he's clearly exercising an awful lot of restraint. Um, but if, if he has done, uh, you know, an investigation as thorough as he is suggesting, he will know about the secret database. And, and you know, this is, this is not a conspiracy theory. You know, there's documented evidence that they keep records on child abusers, on individuals who have molested or have been accused of molesting children. You know, it's literally in their shepherd book to report information of this nature to the branch. So you, you can't help, uh, from my kind of outside perspective looking in it, to the extent that it is an outside perspective, I'm, I don't know the details of, of all of these harrowing accounts, but you can't help but wonder whether Mr. Shapiro, as someone who clearly takes child sexual abuse very seriously, whether he's not just thinking, why can't we just bust down the doors at Warwick and, and, you know, and get the details of all of them? I think, I, you know, I think this case is, is going to send shockwaves through the society. Certainly hope so. I, I, I really do because, <clears throat> um, you know, they do have extreme power when it comes to subpoenaing records and, you know, they can go in there and get in, you know, the judge says, yes, you can have it. You can, they, they can have it. So, you know, when they are putting their trials together and they have all in you know, their information that could very well be included in, in their documentation, you know, the database of, of offenders. And what's so hurtful and awful and dangerous about this database, not only that, you know, it exists, period and who knows how many over all of the years our offenders are on there right and survivors are just out there with no justice um what's so dangerous is you know like i said the watch hour for this weekend is talking about trusting your brothers and that your brothers are trustworthy and that even if you have like a a little personal issue or maybe they offended you or hurt you in the past you know you need to move past that and this database exists and it's not being used for the protection of their people it's not being um it's not being used to protect the children in the congregation or the women and men in the congregation no everything the society does protects themselves they protect themselves yeah you know it's, it's clear absolutely Let's uh, continue. As we do more and more of these horrific cases, our agents and prosecutors continue to get better at uncovering these crimes. While some of the crimes that these men committed can't be charged due to the statute of limitations, we won't fail to hold them accountable for the crimes that we are charging them with here today. These four presentments lay out the nature of our investigation but I want you to know this investigation is very active and ongoing. I will not comment on these cases or any other matters related to this investigation beyond that at this time, but I will repeat our call to anyone who has suffered abuse. We want you to know that we are here and we are listening. We are urging anyone 
who has had a similar experience to come forward to tell us your story. We're here to listen and we will act. Your case won't be swept under the rug. Your experience will not go unheard. This investigation is intensive and laborious and as I said a moment ago, ongoing. That was very reassuring words there for survivors uh, who, uh, who may feel that their case has been swept under the rug. Uh, Mr. Shapiro effectively saying, come forward, we're listening. Yeah, yeah, it's very reassuring for someone who lives in the Commonwealth. Um, and in my experience, when I do <clears throat> trials like this, um, when you get the victim on the stand, they'll be like, why didn't, <clears throat> you know, why didn't you report it earlier? A lot of them were like, we didn't know where to go. We don't know who to tell. We don't know who to trust. You know, so here you have um, the attorney general saying, come forward. And, and, and if you're living in Pennsylvania and you're a victim, then you can say, oh, I can call the AG's office. So, you know, I, I was very impressed when you did that. And even hearing at the beginning that they've already arrested about 500 predators, just knowing like the statistics about how rape kits are very rarely even looked at and they're usually shelved and like, he's he's serious about this and so i don't know i was just i was stunned honestly by his commi commitment to this because you know I, you you're so weary of political leaders <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um and obviously, you know obviously what 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 he what he learned um has really shaken him yeah and really you know, to the extent where he's got this stance now. So you got to imagine, you know, it's pretty awful, really awful. And he's, he's probably like, I've had enough. This is it. We're going for it, you know? So. And uh, very, very, again, impressive that he is, well, he's an impressive man. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's put it that way. And uh, Sab Sabrina V. Kraft. Uh, saying that anyone molested or threatened, please report to legal authorities now. Stop this abuse and protect yourselves and others now. If you know something, report everything you know to legal authorities now. Uh, it's it's a, a little bit of a... And again, I'm, I'm hoping that I can um, get your input here uh, as survivors of, of abuse, both of you. Um, it is a difficult situation, isn't it? Because on the one hand, you have this imperative to protect other children and, and stop what happened to you happening to others. On the other hand, um, you know, the more survivors I've spoken to over the years, and I've been doing this uh, activism work for 10 years now, and I've spoken to many, many survivors, and it's, it's clear that even just talking about it to, let's say, a police officer um, is to, to some degree reliving it, and perhaps to some degree giving power to the individual who caused it to begin with and and is itself a traumatizing experience so you, you can even though you you know you would want everybody to come forward at the same time um would it be fair to say that you know we can acknowledge how how um how much courage and bravery it takes to do that yeah it it, it does because you have to you know recount you know what it, what it happened to you and a lot of these victims don't come forward until years later and, you know, their memories aren't, you know, they're young, they're kids. They don't remember if it happened on a Tuesday or a Friday and, you know, what they were wearing. And, you know, so it just gets when it goes to trial and these children are, are being cross-examined, it, it breaks my heart sometimes because, you know, they don't know times, dates, you know. Right. <clears throat> and um, I think even in one of these cases, the... Uh, one of the men had um, seven victims or survivors and only two were able to give their witness statements. It, it's not an easy thing. Um, it's not something that you necessarily open up to possibly only your closest people about. Right. Um, right. So having to go over the, the dirty, gritty details and be asked questions and, you know, push to the point where they're questioning the validity of your account, something that you've lived with for however long. It, it's, a, it's a very vulnerable position to be in. 
Um, it's very brave though for the ones are, who can. They're, they're very brave because I did one recently. It wasn't a JW <clears throat> case, but it was a, a very strict religious cult. And he had five daughters, six daughters, and they were all go grown now, but for the courage for them to come forward and, and recount what their father did to them, it was harrowing, absolutely harrowing. Just to, for me sitting there having to take it, you know? Um, so yeah, it, it's, they were brave a lot, you know, very, very, very brave to face their accuser. He's in the room, you know, he's, he's there, you know, and then his attorney is asking questions, putting them, you know, well, this, this didn't happen. You're lying. And, you know, it, it re-traumatizes them all over again. And so, um, Diana, do you think that, um, you know, I know obviously he can, he can only prosecute crimes that happened in Pennsylvania. Um, but do you think that if he were to get an overwhelming amount of proof and evidence and stories and, and things of things that happened by Jehovah's Witnesses in other states, that it might push the investigation beyond his state? Well, <clears throat> so if, for instance, if a victim calls in, say from oh, Florida or whatever, and said, I saw this, and would they would be referred to their jurisdiction. So they would be like, call your local jurisdiction. Um, because he can only, he can only cover crimes that happened in, in the state of Pennsylvania. So, um, so with the comment that you just had, maybe add that if you're in the United States and you wanted to um, contribute or have your story heard that maybe you should contact the attorney general of your particular state and make mention of um, what's happening in Pennsylvania as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's plenty. You can make a police report. You can, you know, call the AG's office. You can call the district attorney's um, office of the county you reside in. There's a plenty of ways. You can even call yeah. trial advocate lines. A lot of kids call those lines as well, and they, they report it as well. So I would say, on. too, about the police report. So I have very little confidence in filing police reports. I was stalked once by an ex uh, by a Jehovah's Witness boyfriend who I broke up with. And um, he threatened me, told me he had a gun. And um, I went to, I asked police and they were like, well, he hasn't hurt you. So there's nothing we can do about it. Right. So, um, so is it possible that you can contact the attorney general with these stories without you know, say your statute of limitations in your state has already expired. You know that. Um, but if you were to bring this to an attorney general and just to add to the the heat that's going on in Pennsylvania right now, would that be possible or would anybody hear that? Do you so think? Like if a new victim came forward? Uh, yeah, like if, say, everybody in this chat right now, anyone who has a survivor story, that from the United States went to their particular state attorney general and mentioned it to add heat to what's happening in Pennsylvania right now. Do you think that that would be heard without a police report? Yeah, you don't need to. <clears throat> you don't need to um, go to the police. Um, at, um, Does that make sense? What I said. Yeah, yeah. You can you can <laughs> call like your your state rep or whatever. Eventually, you're going to have to you know, file it, the police, with the police. But what happens was, you know, charges are filed, but the police is in the DA of the county or the, you know, there's always, they, they're the ones who actually bring the charges. Those are the ones who decide whether it's a felony or would they say an IDSI, forcible rape. They're the ones who actually do the grading of, of the offenses. The police is just sort of like the affiant. They just you know, they just take the statements and, and hand it over. And they usually, they, please don't interview the children either. The children are interviewed um, by a special um, organization called the Children's Alliance. And they're trained forensic interviewers um, who sit down with the children. It's, it's on TV. Unlike elders. Yeah, right. 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 Appropriate questions. Um, you know, they, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's not like the police question them. They, they hand them over to the professionals, which should be done. Somebody mm -hmm. that's trained to question these children. 
Thank you for that insight. That's very helpful. And again, highlights the fact that we're dealing with an organisation that doesn't care a jot about the sensitivities of investigating these crimes. We have found victims, we have heard their voices, and we have corroborated their complaints, and our work continues. Today we have the opportunity to reach out and to publicly ask if anyone has information regarding similar allegations of sexual assault, please contact our office immediately. We have established a special hotline just for you. That number is 1-888-538-8541. Again, that special hotline we've established just for you is 888-538-8541. And with that, I'll do my best to answer your questions with the understanding, of course, that I'm constrained in what I can speak of due to the nature that this investigation is active and ongoing. All I can say is that our case is active and ongoing. It's interesting that she's effectively saying there, do you think this might be the tip of the iceberg? Yeah, you, yeah, you, you can re yeah, read you in his that. body language the fact that he wants to say, of course, yes. it's national. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I'm obviously constrained today uh, based on what is written in these presentments. And I think as the prosecution begins, um, more information will be presented as we make our case, um, which may help address your questions. Go ahead. Um, I just want to be clear. Um, you said that all four of the men charged were uh, Jehovah Witness. Is that correct? They were involved there, yes. So do you think it's something within that um, religion itself? I mean, because these men were not from the same area. They were from different counties. I really can't comment beyond what I've already said and beyond what's in the four corners of the presentment. And as I said a moment ago to your colleague, as we move forward here, as the prosecution begins, I think more information will be presented as we make our case. That is such a good question. I didn't hear that one before. Amazing. Yeah. Good question. So similar to the first question, you know, the mm -hmm. first question was, you know, is, is this effectively just the tip of the iceberg? I'm, I'm paraphrasing. And then right. the, second, the second question, you know, all four men are uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, you know, is is this a problem with the religion itself? And again, for me, it's so good to have people asking that question finally. Yeah. So people that aren't affiliated with Jehovah's Witnesses. Exactly. Mm. You know, right. And yeah. and for me, the body language there is, um, he he has an answer in his in his in his mind, ready to ready to go. But he's, there's a lot of restraint being exercised, uh, from my perspective, at least. So, yeah. Question. Okay, thank you all very much. Oh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, again, very, very impressive chap. Um, the district, adjourn, uh, district attorney, sorry, attorney general, uh, uh, Shapiro there. And he's and up for re-election this week, too. <laughs> well, it's not that we're at all political here on JW Watch, <laughs> but you, you form your own conclusions based on what we've seen here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, wow. Well, listen, um, typically what, what we do on these episodes is having, having discussed uh, the story, uh, we do a roundup at the end of, of the panel. And, you know, I've certainly learned a lot from not just listening to Mr. Shapiro's um, press briefing, but also uh, getting your input, uh, both as survivors and Diana, in your case, as somebody with quite extensive background, you know, in the legal process. Um, I, I wonder if we can just um, invite both of you to offer kind of concluding comments uh, about this incredibly disturbing case. Perhaps um, Jana first. It is incredibly disturbing. Um, and it's it was so hard for me to watch it the first time. 
um, just sitting through the details and having those, like, there's the part where the, she said her mother told her to lock her door when her, I used to make sure my sister's doors were closed before dad came home but at nighttime, made sure their bedroom doors were closed. Like, this is, in. I've spoken to, like I said, so many brothers and sisters who unfortunately have suffered abuses uh, that just did not get addressed because they were brought to the elders and either there were no two witnesses or their abuser was repentant and it was held and left in Jehovah's hands. And that, I'm just, I, I hope that he's serious about this, um, uh, pursuing this. I hope that people call that hotline, um, and get their stories out there. Um, and I, I just think that, you know, if this could be the first domino in bringing down that secret database and bringing justice to all of those and, and, having some reform in the Jehovah's Witness religion because the way that it's set up now is is enabling the predators and it's not protecting the children um, and in unless they respond to awful awful stories like this this is why we have to do this. This is why we have to talk about it. Very well said. And um, Jana, um, it seems fitting to just point out that um, you are doing a very good job on your YouTube channel. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> drawing, drawing attention to the controlling nature of the Jehovah's Witness uh, organization. Uh, how can viewers find you and find your content? So it is youtube.com at a black sheep. Instead of E's, it's threes. So 33, basically. Um, and uh, every Friday, I do an episode of uh, This Bites, which is a series where I take the weekly Can watch. See that again, edition. sorry. The, the, the one behind you, it looks really interesting. This Oh, it might be backwards. There we go. <laughs> I don't okay. know how the camera's picking That's it up. That's fine. That's fine, yeah. Um, but I, uh, I take the weekly watchtower and see how the bite model is implemented in the writing. And this weekend is, it's uh, a lot about, it uh, has a lot of dangerous rhetoric in it. Um, mm -hmm about sweeping things under the rug so uh yeah so it's at a black sheep on youtube fantastic i, I will try uh, well not just try i will put a link <laughs> in the description along with um the telephone number for people to ring i think it's fantastic that they have a hotline um i wish there were more hotlines of that kind uh, not just in Pennsylvania, but, but elsewhere around the world, in, in fact, for uh, survivors to call. Um, Diana, um, I want to really thank you for coming on the channel and, and again, sharing your knowledge. Um, I introduced you, it's occurred to me that I introduced you as having some inside knowledge regarding uh, one of the defendants um are you able to talk about that at all or is that a little bit outside of what you're able to discuss um i i will say that i am familiar i do know one of the defendants hmm. in particular his spouse right um and <clears throat> you know um i've heard it hasn't been easy on anybody um but yeah it 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 didn't come as a shock to me because of some of the things I have known and I don't want to divulge, but sure. um, I'm just very saddened, very, mm. very, very saddened about it, you know, for, for the families, for the victims, you know, um, and the local congregations around here, um, you know, my mother is still very active, you know, and I know she's seen the, the news, the news um, and watched it. She hasn't said anything, but, but just in closing, um, 
I, I want to say that when I saw this news newscast, I, I was relieved. You know, this is something that I have been wanting to happen for years. And, you know, I, I was just like a big weight came off me. I'm like, finally, 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 I think something is going to be done. It's, it's somebody's making noise that isn't just some, you know, the local, it's, it's the attorney general and bringing awareness to the general public that this is happening. This, you know, this is, this is happening. And um, hopefully something can be done about it and to stop this, to just, just to stop this. I think this is the beginning of the, you know, the decline uh, of the Watchtower. I, I think that the lawsuits are going to pile up because, you know, we got criminal charges, but then again, you got civil stuff coming down the line too. So yeah, it's, it's going to be something I'm going to watch. Um, and, you know, as soon as I get some information about what stage it's at, um, you know, whether it's set for trial or, you know, discovery process, you know, I'll, I'll drop you a line and let you know, Lloyd. Thank you. And, uh, you know, if I may say, I know that, you know, you've been put under pressure to not appear on this live stream. And um, I think it means, well, I don't think I know it means an awful lot to me that, that on such an important topic as this, you are sharing your knowledge with my viewers. I know my viewers will very, very much appreciate. I really appreciated it. Even I yeah. learned stuff about how, how the process <laughs> I works. I just thought it was that important to, mm. you know, to come on and, and comment. And yes, that people were putting pressure on me, but you know, I have my own mind and my make my own opinions. And, you know, I would put everything aside and, and focus on what the real issue is yeah. here. And the real issue is the, the children. It's this Thank season. You. But the, all the infighting, no. It's it's getting, you know, help for these victims and making it stop. Thank you. And, and I uh, would like, if sorry, you don't on. mind, somebody mm -hmm. in the comments asked, um, you know, what's the conclusion to all this? Um, and of course, it's hopefully that there's justice served with the legal department. Um, but like Lloyd said, he's going to post the, the phone number um, in the description. So I would say if you are in the United States and have, uh, unfortunately, any of these experiences, call the number. Yeah. I, I know that he can't prosecute for you if you're not in his state um but it might help you know push that domino they probably will say well we can't help you it's out of our jurisdiction but give them a, a, of a person to call at least it's the first step you know and so yeah they won't just say oh no you're in california we can't deal with you they, they will probably say oh well you, you need to contact this number so yes, they can do that. And you, and you like to think that at, at least a percentage of the evidence that has been amassed over this three-year investigation is transferable between states. You know, case-specific stuff won't be. But you know, when we're talking about investigations into the policies and you know various various cultural and theological positions held by Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, you like to think that, that there can be some kind of sharing of knowledge so that there isn't a, a kind of a duplication of efforts. So, right. Right. And, you so know, that, and if it does, you would help. <laughs> well, if it does go to trial, um, the transcripts will be public, you know, anybody can order them. So the transcripts will be out there, you know, it's, it's, that won't be secret. So, you know, and then, you know, people could have access, they can purchase them. If they want them. Sure. Well, uh, Diana, um, you know, you are more than welcome to rejoin us uh, as this case unfolds um, in the future, you know, as you have availability. Um, I'd be I'm more gonna, than happy to, yes. Thank you. I'm going to be honest, it eats away at me, this stuff. And I think I speak for all of us, you know, and you, you could see it in Mr. Shapiro's body language that it eats away at him. It's a very um, emotionally draining and triggering subject to be exposing one's mind to even if you're not a survivor you know well, um, or especially if you are a survivor well you know yeah. i've heard hundreds over the years hundreds of children give testimony hundreds yeah I, i'm i'm still kind of 
a reeling from the work I did as a core participant for the um, independent inquiry into child sexual abuse for England and Wales. You know, that that was mm. that took up months of my life um, in terms of compiling evidence and quite frankly getting an unsatisfactory conclusion in terms of the public inquiry's findings and recommendations, which I won't go into in this particular live stream. Um, but again, it, it eats away at your soul. So, but but we need to talk about it, you know? Um, this is the sort of thing that can, I think for the majority of people, just fly under the radar. Right. And, and Jehovah's Witnesses kind of keep their um, kind of varnished image as just basically mm-hmm. being God botherers. Um, and, you know, sort of these kind of eccentric people that, you know, aren't really doing any harm other than disturbing people on a Saturday morning. But we know it's not that simple. And it's very, very important for me, and I'm sure for the viewers, the the information that you've shared here. So thanks thanks to both of you for joining me. You're quite welcome. And um, I'll keep you posted and let you know if I hear anything. Wonderful. Thank you, Diana. And thank you for having me, Lloyd. Thank you. An absolute pleasure. So viewers, I hope you have, I don't know whether the word is enjoyed. Um, This is not a subject that can be enjoyed, but it's a subject that we need to hear about. Uh, Again, I'm very grateful to Diana and Jana for joining me for today's episode. Please remember to subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel for more such videos in the future. And for updates on this case, as we are able to provide updates. But for now, all that remains is to say thank you so much for watching. Say-